Come along with me on this journey of deconstruction and discovery. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, here on MindShift Podcast. For the next six weeks, we are going to go on an international tour of the world. I'm bringing you two episodes this week and next week with Canadian David Hayward, also known as The Naked Pastor. And we're going to be getting into that in just a few minutes. Living life without an agenda. And you're going to understand what exactly that means when we get into that with David Hayward in just a little bit, I will give you a hint at this point, though. It has to do with looking at the pervasiveness of religion. And in our case, both David and I were pastors, teachers in evangelical churches and in that system, both in academic education as well as in ministry and or teaching ourselves. We have discovered, uh, and this is something I learned with David, the pervasiveness of religion and not just Christianity but in fact, so many religions that we encounter. The truth is that in society at large, we've all been impacted by religion, basically no matter where you live in the world. People are incurably religious, and sociologists of religion have long noticed this when they study going back to classical religions, pre-classical religions. Humanity has always had a religious streak. Religion is all pervasive. It affects every area of our life. And learning how to disentangle yourself, this is the subject that David and I are going to be getting into this week and next. But as I was saying a minute ago, we are embarking on a worldwide tour because we've got this week and next week, a man from Canada, that's David Hayward. The two weeks after that, I'm bringing you Cindy Wong Brandt from Taiwan. And we're going to be talking about her experiences of looking especially at parenting, the effects of raising your child, not just within evangelicalism or fundamentalism, but really, again, any religion. And we're going to look at how do you, as a parent who is perhaps deconstructing his or her faith, how do you provide your own children with the space to be able to come to their own conclusions rather than indoctrinating them into a particular religious belief or spirituality and that's a very difficult subject and maybe you as a child were raised in that like me so I was raised in church from literally day one and now looking back on it I'm I'm beginning to see the effects that it had on me that sort of upbringing so this is what we're going to be talking about with Cindy Wong Brandt as well as hearing her backstory how she came to evangelicalism and then ultimately deconstructed and then finally after two weeks with Cindy Wong Brandt we're going to go down under We're going to go all the way to Australia, Sydney, Australia, and I'm going to bring you two weeks with Dr. Josie McSkimming. She is a clinical social worker, and she is the author of a book entitled Leaving Christian Fundamentalism and the Reconstruction of Identity. And you know what? That book is exactly what it sounds like. It's perhaps more of an academic work than a popular level book, but what Josie did is she interviewed a lot of people who walked away from fundamentalism. And again, not just limited to Christianity. You can apply the title of fundamentalism to a lot of things, politics as well as religion. And specifically in this case, we're looking at the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And there are hallmarks of all three religions in the way that it affects people's mental health, psychologically, emotionally, sexually, relationally. In so many ways, there are just a laundry list of symptoms that people like her as a therapist have to deal with. And she's had lots and lots of clients over the years, basically people who have walked away from fundamentalism. And she's seen a laundry list of these symptoms that they all seem to have uh, one, one or more or, or a lot of them all together. And so she's written this book, the effects of what it does to people. And then what happens after they leave fundamentalism, the kind of person that they start to become. And really this is, kind of dovetailing with what David and I get into this conversation this week and next week are probably some of the most practical ones that I think I've ever had. I learned a lot from David. He calls himself the naked pastor and I'm going to let him explain what, what that title is all about. But I will say he does warn you don't do a Google search on just the terms naked pastor because you don't know what you're going to come up with, but you probably won't find him if, if you do, especially if you do a Google image search on the terms naked pastor. But You'll find him on Twitter and a lot of other places. He's very active on social media. And we get into not only his backstory, how he got out of fundamentalism as a former pastor of some 30 years, 
and in education and everything else, just like I was. But he talks about some of the real practical steps because his big life journey now is to help other people who are entering into and are going through the process of deconstructing their former faith. And so he really is an expert in talking about the practical things that people deal with and that they go through. And so we'll be getting into that as well as a lot more content in just a few minutes. Now, I'm going to say a couple things really quickly before I bring you part one with David in a minute here. For those who want to support this show on Patreon, I've been doing a lot more in the area of rewards. One of the things is that I'm going to be releasing the episodes a couple of days early for Patreon supporters. So you'll be getting the access to the content around about Wednesday of the week before they come out on Friday. And I'm also publishing some really good bonus content. In fact, I've got a conversation that's been up for about a week now with David Hayward. So if you want to listen to some bonus content, some additional stuff that we got into before we hit the record button for this podcast, that's available on Patreon. So for as little as a dollar a month, you can get access to some really good bonus information. I've also been posting up some thoughts of my own. In fact, recently I put up a post called My Journey of Deconstruction. And this is basically me telling my story, kind of getting into some of the bits and pieces that came together and how I deconstructed, not only walked away from the church, but I also walked away from Christianity altogether. And how did that all happen? How did it come together? Well, if you want to hear that, you can find out by also, as I say, becoming a Patreon supporter and getting access to some of those rewards that are for followers of Mindship Podcast. And as well, you can gain access to the closed Mindship Podcast Facebook group. So that's another really good bonus for as little as a buck a month. If you pledge $20 a month, I will send you a free t-shirt as well as some other cool gifts. I think I'm going to be able to find some stuff here in North Wales that you can't get anywhere else in the world. So look for that if you want to support me at a higher level. All right, so let's get on into it. I'm going to bring you right now then part one with the Naked Pastor David Hayward as we talk about living life without an agenda, part one. I am so happy to be joined by David Hayward, the Naked Pastor, all the way from Canada. Thank you for joining us on the MindShift Podcast, David. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. So where again, you did tell me where you were from, but I'm really bad with place names. You're from, you said, I, we, I thought it was Halifax, but then it turned out that wasn't the case. No, I'm from St. John, New Brunswick. So uh, if you look on a map, we're just north of Maine. Uh, I'm about an hour across the border from Maine. Yeah, I'm on the east coast. I'm in the Maritimes. Yeah, so I'm a, a few hours from Halifax, but that's where I'm located. It is stunningly beautiful country because... Before we moved over here to the United Kingdom, we lived in just north of Boston for about three months. I was an intern at a seminary in Boston in that area, and we drove up to Portland, Maine. So I don't know. It's stunning. We went up the coast, and I mean, it's just amazing. So I don't know how far you are from Portland, Maine, but obviously you got to keep driving north to get to, to where you are. Yeah, a couple hours. Which seminary were you at? I was uh, an intern at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. I was actually a preaching intern under Dr. Haddon Robinson, who's since passed away a few years ago. But I was there for three months, and then we moved from there over to the United Kingdom, where I started my PhD in actually biblical studies and homiletics. So it was a good foundation because I spent a lot of time in the library doing sort of pre-research. So it it gave me a leg up when I actually got here because it was a research degree that I did. So it was it was yeah. quite helpful. And, of course, we'd never been to Boston. We never lived there. So we actually absolutely loved Boston. It's a beautiful place. Well, I that I got my master's in theological studies from Gordon Conwell. Ah, very small world. Now, I mean, you weren't there when I was there, I'm sure, but this was 2000. No, I was there when Dr. Fee was there. I studied under Dr. Gordon Fee, the oh, New yes. Testament textual critic. Very interesting. He's, he's out Regent, uh, or ret- has retired from Regent now, but, yeah, that's where I studied too. So that was a while ago. That was a while ago. Yeah, this was about 12, 13 years ago when we were over there, but it was a beautiful place. But I think now, as we've said before we started recording, those people that we were then are certainly not the same that we are today. No. That's for sure. No. Uh, why do you, I'm interested, you, you're, you're calling yourself the naked pastor. What's that about? Yep. And maybe you could get into your backstory a little bit as well. 
I started blogging when I, in 2004. And my first name, website name was Church Pundit. But then uh, I thought that was a little bit pretentious. So right. <laughs> I put my name in the hat. There was an auction going on for Naked Pastor, and I forgot about it. And then I get this email saying, you've won the auction. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I didn't want this. <laughs> so I didn't know how much it went for, and but it was something like seventy bucks, and so I I bought it. And uh, essentially, the, what I tell people now, uh, I'm the naked pastor, naked because I'm real, and pastor because I care. Uh, I was a pastor at the time of local church, and I was basically wanting to write about and blog about in an honest and vulnerable way the life of a pastor without glossing it over or anything. I just wanted to be raw. And that's how I started blogging back in 2004. It was about 2006 I started cartooning. So the Naked Pastor, you know, sometimes I like the name. Sometimes, you know, I I wondered if it was the greatest choice. But (laughs) because a lot of people, you know, jump to conclusions about what it might mean. But, um, you you know, it's it's stuck. It's memorable, and it's getting more and more popular all the time. So I'm stuck with Naked Pastor, You're but with that's it. basically what it is. It's just this. No, I left the ministry in 2010, but basically it's the vulnerable exposing of the life of uh, a pastor. So that's that's why I chose the name. A lot of people could think, well, you're a nudist pastor. That's what your angle is. You know, you're <laughs> that's what it's all about. I'm sure you've never heard that before in any yeah. connection. No, I mean, you know, you Google naked pastor and you get all kinds of stuff, right? Oh. So it's, uh, and I don't recommend it. But, you know, there's uh, a church for everybody, yeah, so. David. There, there's even a church. I remember seeing a documentary on BBC a few years ago. There's a, there's a clown church. So there's actually a church <laughs> for people who are clowns and it's, it's a real mm. church. I mean, they, they, I watched this thing about these, uh, it was a convention, a clown convention in Texas. And part of the weekend of this clown convention was they had a church service and all the clowns dressed up in their clown costumes and came to the clown church. And uh, I thought, okay, so if you can do the naked pastor, we can do clown church. Hey, man, we can do anything, anything when (laughs) anything goes when it comes to church. You can't make this stuff up. You literally cannot make it up. No, it's true. It's true. Do they call their God it or not? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. know. I wonder. Maybe that. Yeah. Maybe they're instead of the Bible. That's their book is uh, you know something by Stephen King. I don't know, but it was very <laughs> surreal to watch. And one of the weird things about the that I remember this clown church service was that they made um, you know they how they make the balloon art out of the the stretchy balloons. They made they were making crosses out of the balloons and handing them out to everybody. Balloon crosses at the clown church. You know. So I mean. <laughs> You just, what can well, you say? You, you know, uh, a lot of people already feel like they have to paint a smile on their face to go to church. So, yeah, I think you might be able to cartoon something with uh, <laughs> the clown shirt. <laughs> it's actually not that much of a stretch. You put the mask on because I felt that way. <laughs> and I'm true. sure you did as a pastor. But, I mean, I can remember, I've said this before in other podcasts, but I can remember when I was at my lowest ebb, when I was a pastor, I was so burned out and so frustrated with everything at the church. I can remember going into my office uh, about an hour or two before the service started, and I knew I had to go out there and preach and face those people, and I knew they were gossiping about me and talking about me behind my back, and I would sit in my office and I would play gospel music, you know, upbeat happy music to get me kind of pumped up so I could just go out there and deal with the stress and the trauma of dealing with the church. So uh, I was definitely yeah. painting a smile on my face and I did not feel happy at all. I was miserable. So it's not a good place yeah. to be for sure. No, no, that's true. I, that's, you know what? The, the more I'm into what I do, the more I discover there's a lot of pastors in that situation. You know, there's parishioners, you know, church members who are like that too, who, feel like they have to fake it. Um, but there's a lot of pastors in that situation also. I, I've said it many times. Ministry is is one of the most, if not the most, thankless, exhausting, tiring jobs that, that there can be. I mean, I used to tell my students that all the time. I would say, are, you know, why are you here at this Bible college? Are you sure you want to do this? Because I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but I'm telling you, yeah. it is. it can be a brutal, thankless, exhausting job. And then... You're not even getting into what happens when the pastor, him or herself, starts to doubt their, their own faith, starts to deconstruct. Can they be real? Can they be vulnerable and express those doubts? Because that, a lot of times they end up getting sacked 
they get fired. Yeah. Oh, I know. Been there, done that. Is that what happened to you then? Did you get sacked for expressing your doubts and your de- deconstruction? Well, the the last church that I pastored, I pastored, l- let's just make a long story short and simplify it, but I, I became the pastor of this church in 96, and I was basically the pastor of that church until I left in 2010. And I loved the church. It was an amazing gathering of people. It was an amazing community. I'm fascinated with community how to build healthy community, functional community. Um, and, and a part of that is uh, authenticity. I, I used to say authenticity with accountability. So I'm allowed to be authentic, but if I hurt you, you are allowed to tell me. So it was a powerful, dynamic community. I, I actually loved it. And my leadership team was amazing, incredible support. And in that in that context, I felt the freedom to explore. I'm a very curious, thoughtful person. I, I love to think and explore um, matters of faith and theology and spirituality. And I was I was going for it. I was all in. And so I was exploring, investigating, researching, and I I felt myself progressing and growing and maturing and deepening. And so. Being a part of this authentic community, I felt it was not only incumbent upon me to share, but that I was allowed to share because it was a safe place to do so. But then, you know, over time, as it began approaching the end, I go into detail in this in my book, Questions Are the Answer. You can get it on Amazon, but the Questions Are the Answer, I tell the story about how in around 2009, I had this powerful dream that shook my world. I woke up and I... I it it that's when the deconstruction I had been going through really crystallized and I felt this amazing peace come over me and I felt like I was everything was okay and that I was free to proceed and when I was ex- started to express these things as I was expressing so many other things on my blog um it gathered the attention of some people including my superiors and other churches in my denomination, and eventually some of the people in my congregation. And it, there was concern because even though I felt I had permission to explore, I soon discovered that the box was only so big, that there were limits. So I, it was in 2010 where it became very, very clear that me and the congregation were no longer compatible theologically. And what I mean by that is I was going further than they were comfortable with. And I I don't mean further with my assertions. I mean further with my doubts and my questions. So for me, an important part of our spiritual journey is to ask questions and to entertain our doubts, um, not to squash them. And so I would, I felt free um, and obligated personally and to the, and to the congregation as their pastor to explore these questions I was faced with and to dig into my doubts. And it, it was, it pushed me further than they felt comfortable with. And, and then we just came to the point where we agreed that we were no longer compatible and I resigned. So. So you uh, stepped away. And that was in 2000, March of 2010, and um, I've been out of the ministry ever since. You got you actually walked no, away. No, but it was clear. Yeah, it wasn't uh, going to happen. I, it was clear that you can't fire me, I quit. Kind of thing. <laughs> you didn't say take <laughs> you know? this job and shove it, but yeah, you were the, – the, the writing was on the wall. You knew that you couldn't stay there. Why do you think people go to church? I mean, I know that's a broad question, but – in, in your description of what happened at your church when you were the pastor, it makes me think, what are they, what are they there for? I mean, are they there to be confirmed in what they already believe and think? And then if you push them to, like you say, places they don't, they're not willing or ready or able to go, you have to go rather than them actually stretching and maybe growing and experiencing a whole new reality. What are they doing there? What, why, what, what are they, what are they at this church for? Well, uh, well, you know, to to be frank, uh, a lot of people do go to church to get the answers and to be confirmed in what they believe. I, I've actually had people sit down in front of me and say, 
it's your job to tell me what to believe. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to doubt. I don't want to question because it's not a comfortable thing. It's, it's a scary, often terrifying process to, well, no, it, it almost always is, oh, it is. Uh, to doubt and to question. And, uh, you know, the core beliefs that used to be central to your whole spirituality suddenly starts to crumble. That's a very, very unsettling experience. Oh, definitely. But most pe- so most people avoid that. So, like, for example, James Fowler's Stages of Faith, which I think is an important work, and he talks about six stages of faith. My observation is that the church is comfortable taking people to about level three. Even that's a little bit scary because at, in level three, the later stages of the d- development of level three is when people start to question and have doubts. That's where the church drops the ball, in my opinion, generally speaking. That's where the church drops the ball, because if you allow questions, then you're opening the door to chaos and you're, you're losing control of the, of the people in the congregation, the community. So I think the church, generally speaking, and I do speak generally because there are churches out there that allow you to progress beyond stage three. But to get into stage four, where you seriously question everything you've ever believed and doubt everything you've ever felt were true. Uh, there's a few churches that embrace that stage. So we're stuck in level two, three, you know, where we are absolutely certain and doubt is uh, of the devil and questions are from Satan, you know, all these oh, kinds yes. of things. And we deny and close our ears and, you know, lock the door to our future. In fact, I've seen I've seen some people who start the deconstruction journey and it's so terrifying that they revert back to an earlier stage and promise to stay there and stay stuck there because it's just too terrifying to uh, move into the later stages of uh, what James Fowler calls faith. The idea is you double down, don't you? You say, okay, that that's too scary. So what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back and dig in even further maybe where than where I was before. It's just uh, it's a stage that you're, yeah, like I say, it's so terrifying well, I was thinking a couple things too when you were talking about those stages of faith. One thing is it's it's a part of our very identity as well. So not only are we questioning our belief system, it's it's our actual core identity, our worldview, and you're starting to question those things. That's huge. And the other thing I was thinking of is that this, there's there's kind of two paths, isn't there? The church tends to they give a whole bunch of of answers to your doubts and questions. And then if those don't satisfy you and you still have doubts, then they throw it back on the, on you, the person who's having the doubts. And they'll say things like, yeah, doubt is of the devil, or maybe you have unconfessed secret sin in your life. And that's why you're having these doubts. That's your problem. And so you, you're doubting the doubter almost. And then you're, you're, you're right. getting into trauma and, and psychological, emotional abuse and all kinds of horrible things. Because people are going going away, racking their brains, thinking, what kind of sin am I doing in secret that I don't know about or something that, that I'm having all these doubts? Maybe it's me. It's my fault. It's my problem. Exactly. Yeah. It's like I said, uh, people who doubt and question, it makes makes things very, very uncomfortable. I always try to provide a safe place for people to ask questions and to doubt because I saw it as a crucial, necessary part of the process of spiritual growth. And all spiritual systems, I think, encourage that, um, ones that believe in growing to maturity, that doubts and questions are very much a part of the of the process, so that the enemy of faith isn't doubt, but certainty, you know, I think it was Martin Luther who said that. And, and so, to a, give people a safe space to ask their questions. That's what I love to do. And I felt I was permitted that same space, but Obviously only to were. a point, yeah, only to a certain to point I discovered because I actually had people in my congregation who started believing I'm, I no longer believed in God and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Whether or not that's true, that's another topic. But when, when people who are very, l- l- let's say, uh, orthodox yeah. start to think their pastor isn't doesn't believe in God. Then uh, you know, That's I felt it was best for me and for the church for me to um, to leave. Well, just look at the doctrine of hell. Just one example. This is something I talked about with Andrew Jasko in our podcast a while ago. That is such a threatening thing because 
if, for example, I don't know what you believe about it, but if you get to the point where you think to yourself, maybe I don't believe in hell anymore the way it was told and taught to me, this eternal fiery conscious torment sort of thing. But if we're wrong about that, that the stakes are impossibly high. If I'm wrong about dismissing hell and then I end up going to hell because I was wrong, you know, that that's yeah. that's huge. We're not playing games here, man. If we're wrong about hell and we're dismissing it and we turn around and we find ourselves consigned there for eternity, that's a pretty big mistake to make. Right. That's huge. That's, it's that's, all or nothing. That's that's totally right. Like, I, I've drawn cartoons about that where, because I went through that myself, where if if I don't believe in hell anymore, then I'm actually going to go there. <laughs> you know? It's terrifying. So it's, uh, it, it is very terrifying. And, and it's not like it's, you know, a lot of people who've never been where we are in evangelicalism or conservatism or fundamentalism or, or anything like this, they don't understand. Some people think, well, it's just like, stop believing in unicorns. I mean, it's easy. It's no big deal. But they don't realize that Christian belief, evangelical belief, fundamentalist belief or whatever is global in its reach. I mean, it includes every aspect of our life. It's so enmeshed in our in our DNA that it's it'd be like you know, trying to cut off our own heads. Like it's, it's that serious. Yeah. It's true. So it's not the same as stopping believing in unicorns or Santa Claus or whatever, or the spaghetti monster or whatever you want to compare it to. This Christian belief claims everything about our lives, every single cellular aspect. And, and to just say, stop believing in it and then ridiculing people uh, who don't uh, it's, it, it just underestimates the the power that that uh, religious belief has it's all pervasive as you say if your identity as you say is so wrapped up in your belief system it, you're, you're denying yourself in in a way this is the person i've been for all of my life i was raised in it right. i could say indoctrinated into it i always believed it from from the from day one and now though that i look back on it and I think I see the the psychological, the emotional, the sexual trauma and the damage that evangelicalism and fundamentalism has done to me. It's 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 quite staggering. So you can see why people become angry atheists or what I call there's another category, angry theists. They're not necessarily saying there is no God. They're very angry at that God for doing this to them because they're so they're so damaged by the system whatever it has become, it's done a tremendous amount of damage and is still doing damage to people. I mean, you just look at the purity culture and all the other stuff that goes on, the sexual abuse, you know, the patriarchy, the misogyny, the list is almost endless. Right. Well, people who deconstruct, uh, especially, you know, when they're adults, and that's mostly when it happens, they, and I mean theologically deconstruct, I don't mean, there's different kinds of deconstruction. One of them one of them is uh, deconstructing our relationship with the church. That's one thing. Another thing is deconstructing our beliefs, deconstructing our beliefs. And that, when that happens in adulthood, uh, maybe in our late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we no longer know how to be in the world because Christianity and our beliefs colored everything that we did from sleeping to eating to how we looked to who we hung out with to how we talked to, uh, you know, who we married, to how we had sex, to how we raised our kids, to what we studied and read, to what we watched, like every little Everything. aspect of our lives were colored by what we believe. And then when that belief crumbles and deconstructs and we're left with, it, it's almost like the strings have all uh, popped off the guitar and we don't know how to make music anymore because, you know, the, the things that held it all together are gone. That's a great example. Well, my sister was just telling me, we were talking about this last night, and she made the comment that since she has deconstructed and walked away from not just the church, but Christianity as well, her whole life has changed. And just one example she had was just in terms of relationships with other people, because every time she tried to build a relationship with someone who was a, quote, non-Christian, it was always for the purpose of proselytizing that other person. It was, it was, yeah. I'm going to be a friend to you with the aim of telling you the gospel and, and trying to yeah. get you to come to my church. And she was telling me the yeah. other day about, 
she's a park ranger up in the mountains and she invited a coworker out for a beer and they went out and just had a drink, had a great time. And then after the thing was over, she kind of thought, wait a minute, I just had fun. I didn't even think once about trying to evangelize this person. We just had fun. It was just a good yeah. time at a pub. And it was shocking yeah. to her as she actually sat back and looked at the dynamics that had changed and how free she felt because she wasn't constrained anymore by having to proselytize this person. Yeah, man. I, you know, I write about this a lot uh, on naked pastor and uh, I have an online community called the lasting supper where uh, it's a, it's a, a group for people who are deconstructing or who already have deconstructed. We talk about this all the time. And, you know, one of the, it's just like that relationships where, we just be, we, we just exist, we just are, and there's no agenda exactly. to every little thing we do. And, you know, it, it's really hard practice to, to learn just to, just to be and let go of the agenda. It's, it's like learning how to be a Zen monk, you know, just yeah. <laughs> living your life, enjoying relationships, being in love, being loved eating, all these things without, they're always being an ulterior motive or an agenda or a goal or a mission or whatever. It's a whole new way of life. And, you know, it's one I really, really enjoy. It's no less spiritual. In fact, I feel my life's far more, far more deep spiritual. spiritually than it ever was. But uh, it, it, it doesn't have the toxins that were there before, like agenda and goal and mission and all those things. And including including a, a little bit of superiority, feeling like oh, yes. you're better than the other person and you need to pull them into your worldview. You need to proselytize them and help them become a Christian. You know, I, I just reflecting on what you were just talking about, I, and I'm just sitting here thinking back on my life, and you're so right. I've never seen it that way, that every every aspect down to that cellular level, you're right, is somehow affected by our Christian faith. I mean, I was just thinking about when I was working at the church in just south of Portland in Oregon, we bought a house not far from the building. And even that was, you know, missional. That was strategically, bought, that was a strategic purpose to be close to the building, to put roots down in that community, to build relationships so that with the aim of bringing our our neighbors, our, our friends, our co-workers that we were going to meet and proselytize to bring them to our church. So we couldn't mm -hmm. even, we couldn't even buy a house. It had, everything had to be filtered through that lens of evangelism, mission, proselytizing and all the rest of it. It's unbelievable when you think about it. Yeah, it, it, it really is all encompassing and completely thorough. The, the way belief and meshes itself with our, you know, our lives. It's complete, complete, total. I was mentioning earlier, if you recall, in the introduction before we got into the chat with David, that I learned so much from David in those two conversations that we had this week and next week that what I actually did when I was editing these podcasts was I started to realize how great the content really was. And so I actually started making notes and I filled up an entire sheet of pa paper and I kept thinking, oh, that's a great point. Oh, that's another really good point. I need to get this down. So I filled up the entire page with stuff that David was saying. What I've done is I've gone through and I've created a bonus episode for Patreon supporters and I've kind of gone through some of those in a little bit finer detail, unpacking and commenting on some of the points that David was making that I filled up that sheet with. So again, if you want to support this show, you can have access to great content like that. If you're the kind of person that David and I were describing in these episodes today and next week, then you're going to want to listen in on that as well, because this can help you in terms of your own journey. Where are you headed? Where are you going? The fact is, is that people who have walked away from the church, as David said, there's two kinds of elements to the deconstruction process. One is deconstructing our relationship with the church, and that can be often a very entangled one, because if you're like me and so many other people, you spent your life in service to the church somehow, whether you were in, in ministry or whatever capacity as a member of a church, maybe you were heavily involved in a church. And so there's a huge part of your life that was wrapped up in service to the church and, of course, relationships with many, many other people. And these are very difficult to walk away from. And there's a lot of 
pushback sometimes from people if you do leave the church. And so that's one whole piece of the deconstruction. The other piece, of course, is the theological deconstruction. Now you're getting into what do you actually believe? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about God and Jesus? And if you start questioning those things, now you're talking about your very core identity, and it's very threatening, it's very scary. And so what I do in this bonus Patreon episode is I go through and I discuss a little bit more in depth what David's talking about and what that what that all means, I guess, to someone like myself who is currently going through that very journey myself. I've walked away from the church like 10 years ago, but now I really feel like I'm starting to look at my own theological beliefs, and that's a very threatening thing. And so if this describes you at all, hopefully that bonus content on Patreon will help. The links to those are in the show notes. You can find my page on Patreon and find out a little bit more information as well as other bonus interviews. The one with David Hayward, the one with Chris Stroop that's already up there, and then my own journey of deconstruction. And I'm going to be trying to put more content on Patreon from time to time, as well as releasing new episodes, as I said before, about a a couple of days early before they drop on Friday. So you can have early access to the podcasts around about Wednesday of the week. So let's come back next week then. Check out part two with David Hayward. We're going to go on into our conversation about living life without an agenda. And hopefully that title will begin to make a little bit more sense. Hopefully it's made a little bit more sense just listening to the first half of this one. So come back next week. Catch me and David Hayward, the Naked Pastor, as we try to live life without an agenda. Thank you for joining me again on Mindship Podcast, and I'll see you with David Hayward right here next week. Yes, David.